All right, Lisa, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Everybody, I have 10 o'clock. Um, well, welcome so much for joining us today at Hatfields Marine Science Day online. We are coming to you live from Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center located in Newport, Oregon. I hope you're someplace maybe wearing slippers with a good cup of coffee, um, but we are so excited to have you here. My name is Cinnamon Moffat. I am the research program manager and I will be your host for today's event. A couple of details to get us started. This is a webinar format, which means you do not have control of your mics, cameras, or any screen share capabilities, but we are hoping that you put in all of your questions into the chat box, which you can find at the bottom or the top of your screen. Please note that chat is a little different today. Um, they are only coming in to the panelists so that Lisa and I can see your questions, but they don't interrupt the viewing pleasure for all of you. But please put in your questions um, throughout the talk and we'll work through them at the end. Also wanted to let folks know that this is being recorded and we will put it up on the Marine Science Day page in a couple of days. So if you miss something or wanna watch it again, feel free to come back and it will be there um, for your viewing pleasure. Um, for this first event, this keynote for our big day today, I would like to introduce Dr. Lisa Balance. She is the director of Oregon State University's Marine Mammal Institute, the endowed chair for marine mammal research, and a professor of fisheries, wildlife, and conservation sciences. In this role, she oversees the vision and implementation of research, education, and outreach for the Institute's 50 professors, postdocs, students, and staff. Before joining OSU's Marine Mammal Institute, Dr. Balance directed NOAA's um, Marine Mammal and Turtle Research Division in La Jolla, California, providing scientific leadership and oversight of applied research and the context for endangered species and marine mammal protection act derivatives. She was also chief scientist at NOAA's Eastern Tropical Pacific Dolphin Research Program, um, which provided the scientific basis for the dolphin safe label that can be found on tuna cans in supermarkets all over the country. Dr. Balance holds a PhD in marine ecology, a master's in marine science, and a bachelor's in biology. She has studied ecology and conservation and biology of whales, dolphins, and porpoises, and seabirds for over 30 years around the world. We are so excited to have Lisa um, here for us today as our keynote speaker for Marine Science Day. Dr. Balance, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Thanks so much, Cinnamon. Uh, I am really honored to be here and I'm very excited to tell you all about a mystery whale that we recently uncovered off the coast of Oregon. And by the end of my talk, you'll understand how this local research truly has had global impact. When we think of whales, Many of us think of animals like this one. This is a blue whale. It's the largest animal ever to have lived on the planet. And by the way, those are bottlenose dolphins bow riding on the wave that that whale is creating as it swims through the water. Here's another animal that comes to mind when we think of whales, the humpback whale. This photo from a drone shows three animals blowing bubbles as they swim in ever tightening circles to herd small fish into a tight school, more efficient feeding for these humpback whales. Especially for those of us on the west coast of North America, when we think of whales, we often think of the gray whale. This mother calf pair is migrating along the coast of central California from their breeding grounds and lagoons off the coast of Baja, California, Mexico, to their feeding grounds, which include waters right offshore here of Newport, Oregon, and on up to Alaska. Sperm whales are another animal that comes to mind when we think of whales. Deep divers feeding on squid, highly social with lifespans paralleling humans, and of course, Sperm whales, are <clears throat> sperm whales are of Moby Dick fame. 
And finally, when we think of whales, how can we not think of what is perhaps the most recognizable large animal in the ocean, the killer whale? Highly social, pack hunters, predators of all things that swim in the ocean, even the largest of whales. But there's an entire family of whales in the world's oceans that many have never even heard of and few have even seen. These are known as beaked whales of the family Zephyidae. There are 23 species currently recognized in this group. They're found in all oceans of the world from Arctic seas in the far north to the Southern Ocean that surrounds Antarctica and everywhere in between. They are almost entirely found where the ocean is deep. Although small by whale standards, typically between about 15 and 40 feet long, they can weigh up to 12 tons. And that places them among the largest 0.001% of all animals on earth. And there's a reason that beaked whales are best depicted as a group with this series of drawings rather than photographs. Of all the marine mammals, this is by far the most poorly known group. Let me take a few minutes now to tell you a little bit about what we do know about them. Beaked whales are what we call extreme divers. They dive for long periods of time and they dive to extreme depths. This is Cuvier's beaked whale. By placing satellite tags on animals of this species, we know they dive to almost 3,000 meters. That is two miles under the ocean's surface. During those deep dives, they can remain underwater for as long as two hours and 17 minutes, the record for all marine mammal diving. Deep dives for long periods of time are characteristic of all beaked whales. So why do they dive so deep? This is the answer. Their favorite food is squid, and squid are abundant deep below the ocean surface. At these depths, there is no light at all. So these whales are feeding in complete darkness. They locate their prey not using vision, but using echolocation, producing sounds and listening to echoes as the sound waves reflect off of objects in the water, and those objects include squid. All beaked whales have extremely well-developed echolocation capabilities. And during their dives, they vocalize, produce echolocation clicks constantly. But when they come to the surface, they are silent. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Beaked whales have bizarre teeth. This is Blainville's beaked whale. This animal is swimming to the left. You can see its upper and lower jaws at the far left forming what we call a beak. Near the center of this photo are two protuberances. Those are teeth. There's only one tooth on each side of the head. Both erupt from the lower jaw, which in this species forms an arch that reaches above the top of the skull. Most beaked whale species have such peculiar dentition, only two teeth and only in the lower jaw, one on each side. Every species of beaked whale has teeth that are different from all other species. And here you see drawings of the lower jaw of seven species on the right and on the left, a drawing of the top view of a typical beaked whale skull. So going back to the right hand side of this diagram, you can clearly see that the size, shape, and placement of the teeth are different. What do beaked whales use these teeth for? Not feeding. In fact, beaked whales suck their prey into their mouths, no teeth needed. And only adult males have these teeth. Females remain toothless their entire lives. Males use these teeth to fight each other for access to breeding females. Although these battles have never been witnessed because they take place underneath the water, 
They must be fierce because when jousting males rake each other with their teeth, they sometimes leave deep bleeding furrows along each other's bodies. This is another photo of Blainville's beaked whale. It's a young male. Its teeth have not yet erupted from the lower jaw, but the parallel rake marks you can see on the right side of this photo were made by another male by scraping this animal with its teeth. And by the way, those polka dots you see on the body, those are scars left by cookie cutter sharks. And that's a story for a different time. This is what an older beaked whale looks like. This is Southern bottlenose whale. And as you can see, this male has a lot of battle scars. This is another Blainville's beaked whale. And here you can clearly see these rake marks and very deep healed furrows from extremely aggressive encounters with other males. This animal is swimming away from us. That's a tooth above the jawline on the left. The tooth on the right is broken, probably from battles with other males. And this is strap tooth beaked whale. The teeth of males in this species grow over the top of the upper jaw entirely, constraining it so that the mouth cannot open more than about an inch. And you can see that in the skull on the left side. On the right, the tooth that I am holding shows the sharp denticle at the top. And that denticle is used to gouge other males. Bizarre teeth indeed. One last general characteristic of beaked whales I wanna mention is their behavior at the surface. When beaked whales surface to breathe, they quit vocalizing several minutes and several hundred meters below the surface. Then instead of coming straight up, they veer off in random directions. At the surface, beaked whales take a few quick gulps of air and then descend to several hundred meters for 10 minutes or more before they come to the surface again. They do a series of these relatively shallow breathing dives before they make their next deep foraging dive. So why this erratic and silent surface behavior? Despite their size and deep and long dives, beaked whales are vulnerable to killer whales, the predatory kings of the ocean. There are records and even photos of killer whales attacking, killing, and eating beaked whales. So it's not surprising that beaked whales have evolved various behaviors that help them minimize contact with killer whales. The less time they spend at the surface and the less noise they make there, the less likely they are to attract bad company. This photo shows a Baird's beaked whale at the surface. And this enlargement reveals tooth rake, tooth rake scars on its dorsal fin that have been left by an attacking killer whale. This whale got away but Baird's beaked whales often have killer whale tooth rake marks on them, and it can be assumed that others aren't so lucky. Little wonder beaked whales are wary of their time spent at the surface, and this includes their timidness around research vessels. Typically, they slip below the surface shortly after being sighted, and typically, because of their long dives, they're not seen again. All of these factors, their oceanic distribution, small group sizes, deep and long dives, and silence and evasive behavior at the surface, all of these combine to make beaked whales the most poorly known family of all whales, in fact, of all marine mammals. Of the 23 known species, five have been added since the mid 1960s and six of these species have never been identified alive in the sea. They are known only from animals found on the beach. Why care about beaked whales? Two reasons. First, they represent a largely unknown part of the wondrous diversity of our oceans. And learning more about them is, to put it simply, awe-inspiring. And second, we are increasingly learning that beaked whales are vulnerable to all kinds of threats that we humans are creating. In particular, human enterprise has made our oceans extremely noisy places, from seismic testing used for science and oil exploration, 
to military use of high intensity sonar to detect submarines. These sound sources have resulted in the death of untold numbers of beak whales, apparently because a fright response causes individuals in deep water to bolt to the surface, and that can result in bends-like symptoms for these animals, followed by death. We know so very little about beaked whale numbers and distributions, even how many species there are. The ability to identify them to the species level using their recorded acoustic signals could make it possible to survey these animals using passive acoustic methods. That could be accomplished, for example, by attaching hydrophones and recorders to commercial vessels traveling across oceans within shipping lane highways. With this in mind, we put together an expedition with hopes to provide essential information to better understand the population status of beaked whales, how many there are, and to assess their vulnerabilities to anthropogenic or human-caused sounds. Our explicit goal was to find, find one of these cryptic species and link its acoustic call with its visual characteristics. We were 12 strong on our expedition, seven scientists and five crew, and we aimed to set sail for 30 straight days in the Pacific Ocean. It was a sunny morning early last September when after a Herculean effort from science, ship and shoreside teams, we left Port Dock 3 on the Bayfront here in Newport amidst a bustle of recreational boats heading out for a Saturday on the water. Our vessel was the Pacific Storm. Built as a commercial trawler, she was donated to the Marine Mammal Institute by her owner, and we refitted her as a research vessel. She's 84 feet long and the crow's nest, where we planned to search for whales in a vast ocean, is 25 feet above sea level. Blue skies and complete calm accompanied us as we sailed under the iconic Yaquina Bay Bridge. We had two critical, what I will call science powers aboard, along with the world's best scientists in these two fields. First, the ability to listen to the ocean with an explicit focus on beaked whales. Here's Anna Maria at our acoustics control center. She's listening to underwater sounds in real time, detected by a long cable containing underwater microphones, which we call hydrophones, that are towed behind our Pacific storm. We use a variety of software tools to visualize these sounds because our human sense of vision is much better than our sense of hearing, completely unlike the beaked whales that we were looking for. This is what Anna Maria is concentrating on. Our primary display, the top panel here, consists of little dots, each representing a whale's echolocation click. Each color represents a different frequency. And these dots scroll across the screen in real time from left to right. This is just a screenshot here. As they scroll by, each dot is visible for about one minute, and then it disappears off the screen to the right as new clicks continue to stream in from the left. Anna Maria can click her mouse on any dot she's interested in, and that produces the diagnostic plots below that provide more information. These plots tell us about the time and location of the animal that produced them, and they give us clues about what species produced that echolocation click. Beaked whale well clicks have a unique shape that you can see in the plot with the green background here. The shape of the curve and placement of the peaks in the two plots to the left of the green one provide information that can, in some cases, help determine what species is making this click. This is Baird's beak whale. We had an extraordinary encounter with them about 50 miles offshore of Central Oregon. Now remember, they are silent at the surface, but at depth, they vocalize. And these sound clips were recorded from this encounter. Now in the upper left, watch the image scroll by as the sound plays. Each of those green lines is a click from a single whale. Did you hear anything? Neither did I. 
Most beaked whales vocalize outside of the human hearing range. This is why we need so many displays to see this ultrasonic sound. Now I'm gonna play that same recording slowed so that the frequency is more attuned to human ear ears. And I want you to listen for faint echolocation clicks like this. Still, beak dwell clicks are notoriously difficult to hear, so listen closely. Did you hear anything? If you heard something, you are likely to be young and you're likely to be a female. And if we have time at the end of my talk, I'll explain why. But here I wanna play this one more time, again, amplified even more. Those are echolocation clicks of that bear's beaked whale below the surface looking for squid. Our second key science power out there are these 25 by 150 high powered binoculars. We mounted them on the crow's nest of the Pacific storm and used them to search the ocean all around us out to the horizon from sunup to sundown when sea conditions allowed. And clearly, this was a very fine day to be out there looking for beak whales. Now, remember, our goal was to link the distinctive vocalizations we were hearing from animals at depth with their appearance once they came to the sea surface to breathe. We were particularly interested in the size of the animal, the shape and placement of the dorsal fin, the color and any patterning along the body, and especially, and if we were lucky enough to see an adult male, the teeth, their size, shape, and placement in the lower jaw. As you remember, females and subadults all tend to look alike. It is the adult males that have these species specific characteristics of the teeth. It was September 22nd in the year of 2021 last year. We were about 200 nautical miles west of the Columbia River mouth. Anna Maria and Daniel were monitoring the sounds coming in from our hydrophone towed behind the Pacific storm. Our software was translating the inaudible ultrasonic signals into visual representations. When all of a sudden the computer screen showed a type of beaked whale signal that neither Anna Maria nor Daniel had ever seen before. Just three minutes later, the mystery whales stopped vocalizing. Anna Maria knew exactly what that meant. Those whales would soon be coming to the surface. She immediately directed our captain to pilot the Pacific storm toward where she thought they might surface. Most unfortunately though, we had high winds and heavy seas, very poor sighting conditions. Nonetheless, all of us aboard were called to join the visual search above the vessel from decks all around the boat. We expected only a very faint hope of finding the whales before their next dive. After 80 minutes of searching, this is what we saw. In the poor conditions, Todd, Craig, and Bob had their long lenses on their cameras and their motor drives were firing at full speed. Jay was on deck taking this video. We knew that at any moment the whales could dive or we would lose them behind a wave or in the sun glare. Any moment could be our last sight. Then, to our amazement, these whales came over to the ship. There were a pair of them, and repeatedly they approached the ship, following in our quarter wake, swimming in front of the bow, along either side of us. They were about 15 feet long with spindle shaped bodies, a moderately sloping melon, which is analogous to what we call our forehead, and a medium length beak. The jawline was relatively straight, but with a slight arch toward the back. The dorsal fin was set back about two thirds of the way along the back. It was falcate and wide based, low and triangular. Their overall coloration was medium gray with some modeling, likely associated with sloughing skin. We saw no distinct color patterning around the face. In total, 
We spent just over 40 minutes with these whales at the surface. We got fantastic looks, thousands of photos, and this great video footage. Here are some still photos of these animals. You can see the water droplets associated with the blow of this animal as it surfaces. Here is a great look at the head, the beak, the jawline. Here is the dorsal fin and the mottled skin. And here, the eye just above the waterline on the right side of this photo. You can also see the dimple in the top of the head where the blowhole is. And these yellow colored spots are patches of diatoms growing on the skin. Diatoms growing on skin is fairly common for beaked whales and for other whales in high latitudes. And as we were intensely watching these whales, at times it seemed that they may have been intensely watching us. But despite their inquisitive behavior, these close approaches during a long period of time, and the fact that we had the world's best beaked whale authorities on board as part of our science team, despite all that, we were unable to determine what species these animals were. That's because they were sub-adult animals. Remember, for most beaked whales, if they are not adult males, all species look pretty much the same. But our expedition team does not give up easily. Standing on the bow of our ship with crossbow in hand, Bob took aim and fired a two foot long lightweight dart at one of the animals. Here you can see that dart flying on its way toward the target, the upper back of the animal just in front of the dorsal fin. And by the way, that red wound that you see is a relatively fresh cookie cutter shark bite. Now Bob has collected thousands of these biopsy samples from all kinds of whales, dolphins, and porpoises around the planet. And this dart hit its mark. Here you can see it just after it bounced off this whale's back and before it landed in the water. And that tiny pink bit at the tip of the dart is a pencil eraser sized piece of skin and blubber of our mystery whale. The DNA contained in that biopsy sample held the key to its species identification. Now we were at sea for just one more day. Then we returned to Newport, unpacked the Pacific storm and all returned to our respective homes and workplaces across the country. But the science continued. The first thing we took from the Pacific storm was that biopsy sample. It went straight to our cetacean conservation and genomics laboratory here in the Marine Mammal Institute. And Scott Baker and Debbie Steele immediately went to work. Five days later, we had our answer. Our mystery beaked whales were Hubs beaked whale, Latin name Mesoplodon carl hubsi. And our biopsied whale was a female. And if you want to know more about how to obtain this information from a small piece of tissue, Debbie will tell you in her talk about a half an hour from now. Now, let me take a moment to put all of this into perspective. In 1945, a preeminent American ichthyologist described a beaked whale found alive in the surf near his office in La Jolla, California. Although misidentified originally, the skull, skull and color pattern of this animal were different from any whale previously known to science. And it ultimately became recognized as a new species, Hub's beaked whale. But after 1945, for the next 50 years, it would be known only from specimens found dead on beaches. Fast forward to 1994, a NOAA research vessel was conducting a marine mammal survey off the coast of Oregon when the science team, which included Robert Pittman, who was a part of our expedition, that science team spotted a group of hubs beak whales. How did they know they were hubs beak whales? Because that group included an adult male. 
It was the first and only time this species had ever been identified alive in the wild, and it would not be identified alive again until our project last September. Meanwhile, acousticians, including our acoustics lead, Jay Barlow, were busy listening to the oceans and recording beak whale signals. One of these signals, quite distinctive and unique and repeatedly recorded, was named BW37V, though no one knew what animal produced it. And it was on the day of our extraordinary encounter with that pair of mystery beaked whales that our acoustics team recorded it again. BW37V is Hub's beaked whale. Linking an acoustic call with a visual description of a poorly known whale and confirming the species identification through genetics is an extremely powerful tool because instantly we know a lot more about the at sea distribution of that whale. Hub's beaked whale occurs everywhere BW37V has been recorded. And here is a map of where those calls have been recorded. The large map shows the west coast of North America and those spots in the ocean of different shapes and different colors are recordings of BW37V. So you can see that this whale occurs all along the coast of North America and in the smaller inset to the lower left, that shows the entire North Pacific and those shapes and different colors are additional recordings of BW37V. In fact, Hub's beaked whale occurs all across the North Pacific. Science often, in fact, most often, is part serendipi serendipity. I haven't yet told you that our initial goal for this expedition was to reach the famous garbage patch in the Eastern Pacific Gyre, way far into the vast Pacific, because some of these mystery beak whales had been reported there. But engine transmission problems forced us to return to Newport. Our incredibly skilled crew were able to complete repairs in short order, and we used our remaining sea time to explore the waters offshore of Oregon. As it turns out, we solved a mystery in our own backyard, although perhaps only oceanographers and fishermen would consider 200 miles offshore to be our backyard. This adversity, challenge, risk, camaraderie, and occasionally extraordinary discovery. This is why I became a marine scientist. This research was a collaboration between the Marine Mammal Institute of Oregon State University and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And a special acknowledgement. How many of you have seen these license plates around the state of Oregon? It's a beautiful piece of art representing a gray whale, female and her calf. And for every plate sold or renewed, our Marine Mammal Institute receives $35 to support our research, education and outreach. Our beaked whale expedition was supported in part by these funds. Without those funds, this research would absolutely not have been possible. In closing, last September's expedition was a fantastic success. It was an awesome example of how local research can truly have global impact. And by the way, those whales that have never been seen alive in the wild, those whales are still out there. And we are working hard to plan and connect, conduct another expedition to search for them this coming fall. So watch this space. With that, let me thank you all for attending and I'll invite questions if we have some time.
All right. Thank you so much, Lisa. What an amazing story. Um, for folks that are online, go ahead and put any of your questions into the chat and we'll work through them in the order that I'm getting them. And while you're working on that, there were a couple of questions, Lisa, kind of going back a little bit to the beginning of your story. Um, you had talked about the beaked whales having some um, scars on their body from each other. And then you also talked about some scars from uh, orca whale or killer whale uh, attacks. How do you tell the difference? Oh, that's a great question, Cinnamon. Um, so there are three types of marks on the bodies of these killer, uh, these beaked whales that are quite common. Um, and your question is about the difference between the killer whale toothrake marks and the beaked whale tooth rake marks. And it's, it's, it's a great question and telling the difference is quite easy. And the reason is because beaked whales only have two teeth. Those males have two teeth in the lower jaw. And when they rake each other, they leave tracks, two parallel tracks. Killer whales have a lot more than two teeth. And when they grab hold of a dorsal fin, or a, a flu tail fluke or a pectoral flipper. Uh, they grab it with their entire mouths and there are multiple tooth rake scars. So that's that's essentially the best way we can tell the difference. Great, Great thank question. you. Yeah, so we're getting a couple more questions and for folks online, keep them coming, we'll work through them. Um, so we have a question where you kind of prompted us and said, um, that only young women are able to hear the beaked whale. Can you give us a little more detail? We're curious. Yes, indeed, I can. So um, uh, it, it probably comes as no surprise to, to all of us that as we age, our um, ability to hear deteriorates. And it deteriorates uh, according to essentially how much um, damage uh, our uh, auditory sense has received. One way to damage our sense of hearing is through loud sounds. So if you listen to loud music, uh, if you work around loud machinery, uh, as you age, your um, hearing will deteriorate. Uh, so that's why I said, if you heard those clicks, you were likely to be young. And it turns out that uh, that um, sense of hearing deteriorates more rapidly in males, men, than it does in women. And that's why we have so many female um, marine mammal acousticians, perhaps one reason, um, because women tend to have a more uh, well-developed sense of, of, of hearing. That's so interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we also have a question here asking, have you seen other species of beak whales in person on your adventures? Yes, indeed, uh, I have, um, not many, um, but uh, I have seen that bizarre one, the strap tooth beaked whale, the one where the male has two teeth coming out of the lower jaw that wrap over the upper jaw. Uh, I saw those when I was um, down uh, on a trip um, headed from the southern coast of uh, South America down to Antarctica to study Antarctic killer whales. That was a, 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 an amazing sighting for me. Um, another one that I remember was um, tropical bottlenose whale, Indopacetus pacificus, which I saw way out in the middle of the tropical um, Pacific. At that time, when we saw them, that animal was known only from stranded specimens, and we were able to see it for the first time alive in the wild. Um, so I've seen a few, but it is, uh, it, it, um, <laughs> as I said earlier, there are six species that no one has seen alive in the wild, and, and those species are out there, so we're, we're continuing to look for them. It's amazing that we're still finding new things and new discoveries in the ocean all the time. Um, we've got a question about, um, you said that it was females and juveniles don't have their teeth showing. So do we know what age the males, when their teeth um, are fully grown in and erupted from the skin, you can see them? How old are those males? That's a good question. And the answer is we, we don't really know. Um, the way we age uh, beaked whales, the way we would age them, is by taking one of their teeth and then you cut it 
and cross section it and count growth, what are called growth layer groups in those teeth that corresponds to age, similar to what we do with trees, counting, counting um, rings in trees. Uh, so, so little known is known about beaked whales um, that we would have to, well, you can see why we don't know at what age the teeth erupt in the males. However, because those teeth are related to um, fighting for access to females, we can be fairly certain that those teeth are going to start to erupt as males are beginning to reach sexual maturity. But again, we, we don't know at what age that is. So this kind of leads to the next question. Um, do we know much about life history on the hubs, uh, beaked whales, how long they live, when they become sexually uh, mature, any of those kind of things? We do not, not only do we not know much about that for hubs beaked whale, um, we don't know much about that for beaked whales in general. There are a couple of species that have been uh, more um, uh, predictably located and therefore easier to study. Uh, a couple of these species live off of um, the main Hawaiian islands, for example, and there have been some remarkable, uh, some, there's been some remarkable research that has gone on there, uh, putting satellite tags on those animals to see how far they travel, taking photographs of them to see um, how stable their group sizes are. Uh, another uh, location that is famous for um, predictability of being able to go and find beaked whales is off the uh, east coast of um, of America. Um, but in general, um, beaked whales are, are just very poorly known. We don't know much about them at all. Do we know their population numbers? That was another question and, and you might answer in the same way that we just don't know, but I'll throw uh -huh. it out there. Yeah, so that's a good question. Because they vocalize so predictably and reliably when they're underneath the water surface, one of the best ways to study beaked whales is to listen for them. Um, listening for vocalizations of whales, dolphins, and porpoises, and trying to translate that into numbers of animals can be problematic because for most species, they can choose to vocalize and they can choose not to vocalize. So if you don't hear them, it doesn't mean they're not there. But for beaked whales, because they vocalize constantly when they're underneath the water, when you don't hear beaked whales, it means they're not there. So what we know about beaked whale distribution and abundance is largely based on where we put uh, underwater hydrophones and what those hydrophones are telling us. And we have been able to, in some cases, um, translate those recordings into uh, trends in abundance. So for example, in the um, right here off our coast in the California current, there are acoustic data that indicate that one species of beaked whale that is out there may be declining in abundance. Why? We don't know. Interesting. We have a bunch of questions coming in and I'm going to do my best to get through a couple of them. Um, let's see, do beaked whales give birth at the surface or do mother and calf stay underwater or do we know? Yes. Okay. That's a great question. Um, the answer is we don't know. Uh, I'm not aware that anyone has seen a beaked whale birth. Um, however, uh, beaked whales, like all whales, all marine mammals, breathe, have to breathe air. And when uh, the young are born, they have to get to the surface fairly quickly. Um, typically, what we've seen in other, uh, well, dolphins in particular, when they give birth underneath the water, uh, the, they're fairly close to the surface and the female immediately goes underneath the calf and pushes it to the surface to make sure that it starts to swim and can take a, a breath. So uh, I guess what you could, if you could um, generalize, you might imagine that they wouldn't want to be two miles down below the water when they gave birth to their calves because their calf is going to need to get up to the surface and take a breath. But really, we don't know that. Um, and we're going to wrap up with this question. We have one minute left. Um, if 
Are there opportunities for undergraduates or graduates to get involved with this research? Well, that's a great question. So I hope that my presentation has made it abundantly clear that we have a lot more questions about beaked whales than we have answers. So you bet there are a lot of graduate uh, uh, research degrees, um, master's degrees, PhDs associated with studying beaked whales. Um, we have in the Marine Mammal Institute regular opportunities for undergraduates to get involved in our research. Studying beaked whales is challenging, but it's incredibly exciting and incredibly fulfilling. So um, I can easily be found on uh, the Oregon um, State University's website. Don't hesitate to to touch base with me, all of you out there, if you're interested. Great, thank you so much. And um, we just put a link to learn more about this expedition into the chat. So if folks wanna learn more about this spe specific event, uh, go ahead and check out that link. For everybody else, if you have additional questions, you can also go to the Marine Mammal Institute uh, page on the Marine Science Day under research and discovery and learn more about things there. Or you can go to Google or whatever platform you use and search for the Marine Mammal Institute. They are active online so you can find them. Um, for anybody who had questions we weren't able to answer, uh, please uh, follow up and continue to ask those questions and be involved with us the rest of the day. Lisa already talked about it, but we do have another um, kind of follow up talk um, at 1115 today when Debbie Steele will talk a little bit more about the genetic Genetics work that followed up on this particular event. And for everybody else, um, just kind of picking a little plug, if you are tracking our live events today, your next one will start um, in just a few minutes at 10.50. We have a live animal interaction with the Sea Grant educators looking specifically at anemones. And if you're interested in that, Shannon, can you put in, um, yeah, she just put in the link to the live events. So you can go to that live events link and you can click on the title for the next talk and you can get there where you want to see the next thing. Um, I hope you enjoy Marine Science Day. I hope you enjoy the live events and you explore the website. It will be up for the next year. So if you can't uh, get to everything, you have time. Um, and Lisa, thank you so much for kicking us off being our keynote speaker. It was a wonderful experience to be with you and to have you tell this story with us. My pleasure. Thanks. All right, everybody. Thanks, Lisa, and hopefully you find your next event, everybody. Have a good Marine Science Day online, and I hope to see you at our next live event. All right, everybody, talk to you later. Thanks, Lisa.